Hi history lovers and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past. Today on History Calling I'm going to tell you about one of the greatest royal tragedies and dynastic upsets to ever hit England and one which ultimately resulted in a lengthy civil war and a fight for the crown. I'm speaking about the White Ship Disaster of 1120, which caused the death of the heir to the throne and the demise of the flower of the English nobility, all in one tragic and brutal night. Stick around to hear how this disaster happened, who the dead were, how the few bodies recovered from the water were identified, and what happened next. <laughs> Please remember to give this video a thumbs up and hit the channel's subscribe button with the notification bell switched on so that YouTube lets you know when I upload. My social media and Patreon page are also linked in the description box below if you'd like some additional history calling perks. It's 1120 and the King of England is Henry I, whose father was none other than William the Conqueror. Henry had married Matilda of Scotland, whose original name was actually Edith, back in 1100, and they had had two surviving children, another Matilda in 1102 and a son named William born in 1103, and often known as William Etheling or William the Etheling, William Adelinus or William Adelinkus. I'm just going to call him William for simplicity's sake. Queen Matilda died in 1118, but she'd done her job by providing the all-important male heir, and the succession seemed secure. By 1120, young William was 17 years old and recently married to Matilda of Anjou. His sister Matilda, meanwhile, and I know there are a lot of Matildas in this story, had been married off to the Holy Roman Emperor Henry V when she was 12, and was now the Empress. The other important player in this story who you're going to need to know about is Henry I's nephew, Stephen of Blois, who was the son of his sister, Adela. In November, King Henry, his son, some of his illegitimate children, of which he had many, his nephew Stephen and a whole host of other English nobles were in France, negotiating a peace deal with Louis VI. When the deal was done, it was time to return to England on the 25th of that month. We have several primary sources describing what happened next. One is Orderic Vitalis, an English-born monk then living in France who was already in the process of writing his book Ecclesiastical History, which would later include a description of that fateful night. He tells us that a man named Thomas Fitzstephen obtained an audience with the king before anyone set seal and identified himself as the son of the man who had brought William the Conqueror to England back in 1066. This Thomas had a boat named the Blanche Neff, the White Ship, and asked that he be allowed to convey Henry to England just as his father had conveyed Henry's. The king had already made his travel plans, however, and did not wish to change them, but he entrusted Thomas with his son, Prince William, and 300 others from the royal entourage, including one of his illegitimate sons, Richard, and one of his illegitimate daughters, Matilda, Countess of Perche. I know, another Matilda. His nephew, Stephen of Blois, was also meant to be on board. The prince, who was just 17, remember, now indulged in an act of teenage stupidity which would get virtually everyone who sailed with him killed. The sailors asked him for alcohol, and he obliged. Soon the mariners and much of the rest of the party were all rip-roaring drunk. Stephen of Blois and a few of his comrades, seeing that the boat was full of inebriated youths, opted to disembark, the Orderic also says that this was partly motivated by a bout of diarrhoea on Stephen's part. If so, his misbehaving bowels had just saved his life. The King's boat set off from Barfleur Harbour first, followed later in the night by the White Ship with its intoxicated crew and passengers. Orderic tells us that the 50 experienced rowers were ousted from their positions by William's drunken marine force. Those on board now came up with the bright idea of trying to shoo off by overtaking the king's ship. Those at the oars made it fly through the water, and the luckless pilot, as Orderic calls him, steered at random, sending the ship off course. Just a mile from the shore, it struck Keelboof Rock, which is visible at low tide and underwater at high. The moon was out, so had the rock been above water, it likely would have been seen and avoided. Pandemonium now broke out on board. 
Another original source, William of Malmesbury, describes the battered prow of the vessel hanging off the rock, and though the sailors tried to refloat the vessel, they could not. Some of those on board were swept out to sea immediately, others drowned as the ship went down. The prince, however, could have survived. There was a smaller boat on board, and his guard immediately put him in it and launched. Had they rowed for shore and never looked back, William would have made it. As they departed, though, William of Malmesbury tells us that the heir to the English throne heard the terrified screams of his half-sister, the Countess of Perche, quote, now struggling with death on the larger vessel, and begging him to save her. Unable to bear it, he ordered his men to go back for her, and when their little boat got close to the larger one, it was swamped as panicked men and women jumped onto it. As you can see in this image, it too rapidly sank beneath the waves and was lost, as were all on board, the prince supposedly drowning in the arms of his tutor, the nobleman of Ferry. The captain of the ship, Thomas Fitzstephen, had gone into the water early on, but he surfaced again and called out to those still alive and on board, asking where the king's son was. When they told him the prince was dead, Orderick tells us that he responded that it would be, quote, misery for me to live any longer. Having said this, he abandoned himself to his fate in utter despair, preferring to meet it at once rather than face the rage of the king in his indignation for the loss of his children, or drag out his existence and expiate his crime in a dungeon. Only two men survived the initial disaster. One was a poor butcher named Berold, who came from Rouen. Another was Geoffrey, who was the son of the nobleman Gilbert de l'Aigle. They clung to the yard arm to which the seal had been attached, and which was still sticking up above the water, because remember they crashed on a rock close to shore, so it wasn't particularly deep. Sadly, Orderick tells us, Geoffrey was unable to hold on for long enough, and during the cold November night, the plunging temperatures and exhaustion got to him. He commended Berold to God, then, quote, fell into the sea and disappeared. Berold, however, was able to hold on, and he was the only one of the 300 people who got on the white ship to ever make it back to land alive. Wrapped in a sheepskin coat, he clung on until morning, when he was picked up by a local fishing boat and taken back to shore. And it is from him that virtually all of our knowledge of what happened ultimately derives. For although the screams of people on the stricken vessel could be heard on shore, and Orderick even says that the king's ship far out to sea heard the commotion without realising what the cause was, the level of detail we have about individual conversations and the fate of Prince William and his sister can only have come from someone who was on the white ship. Having survived this terrifying ordeal, Berold would go on to live for another 20 years. A search now began for the bodies of those lost, but most were never found. A few washed up on shore, but had to be identified by the clothing they were wearing, their faces having already started to decompose or be eaten by marine life. As writer William of Malmesbury tells us, Delicate as they were, they became food for the monsters of the deep. Orderic Vitalis tells us that the wreck of the ship was dragged to the shore and its valuables were covered, though I don't know if this is true or not. In 2021, divers said that they had found pieces of it, but without definitive proof of the source of any underwater debris, and given that 900 years has passed and Orderic's assertion that most of the boat was salvaged at the time, I remain sceptical about their claims, though I'm not saying that they don't believe them. I'll leave an article about this supposed discovery linked in the description box below for you to read if you'd like to know more about it. Back in England, when the news of what had happened arrived, no one knew how to tell the king of his and the realm's catastrophic loss, because remember, hundreds of noble families had lost their heirs, not just the monarch. Though his remaining courtiers were in some cases almost broken with grief at the loss of their own loved ones, and the king was asking where his children were and why they had not arrived, when in his presence, Orderick tells us, the nobles concealed their grief. Eventually, the job was delegated to a young child, who was brought crying to Henry, who I think it was assumed wouldn't lash out at a youngster, and told him what had happened. Henry's shock and anguish were so great that he collapsed on the spot and had to be helped to his apartments, where Orderick tells us he gave free course to the bitterness of his grief. Not everyone was heartbroken, though. For then, as now, the royal family and the court weren't popular with everyone, and some writers were not remotely sympathetic. Henry of Huntington wrote of the deceased that 
All of them, or nearly all, were said to be tainted with sodomy, and they were snared and caught. Behold the glittering vengeance of God. They perished, and almost all of them had no burial, and so death suddenly devoured those who had deserved it, although the sea was very calm and there was no wind. The disaster would irrevocably change the direction of English history. With no legitimate male heir to succeed him, Henry now rapidly remarried in an effort to produce another, wedding the teenaged and famously beautiful Adeliza of Louvain at Windsor Castle just two months after Prince William's death. The marriage was childless, however, though Queen Adeliza would go on to have seven children with her second husband, so the issue was obviously some later-in-life fertility problems on Henry I's side. This is strongly reminiscent of what happened to Henry VIII 400 years later, and if you see my video on the Tudor's fertility problems, you can learn more about that. It's linked on screen and below for you. With no new male heir to replace the lost one, Henry now took the unprecedented step of declaring his daughter, Empress Matilda, his heir, and had his nobles swear allegiance to her. One of those who did so was the Empress's cousin, Stephen of Blois, but this was not an oath he would keep. When Henry I died in 1135, Matilda, who was by then married to Geoffrey of Anjou, attempted to make good her claims on the throne, but Stephen took it instead. What followed was a long civil war known as the Anarchy, with Matilda's claims only eventually made good in the person of her son, who became Henry II after Stephen's death in 1154. That's a story for another video, however. Before I leave you, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my patrons for their generous support of this channel, which helps me to keep making these videos for you. If you'd like to become a patron and get some history calling bonus material, see the Patreon link in the description box below. I've also had some questions about making a one-off donation. If that is something you would prefer to do for any reason, YouTube also have a thanks button below videos with preset amounts which will enable you to do so. This allows you to post a customizable and brightly coloured comment and get a one-time animation over the top of the video. Again, I'd like to take this chance to thank you for your support and to emphasise that there's absolutely no pressure to do any of this. Let me know below who you blame for the white ship disaster, whether it's Henry I for letting his teenage son, who was a married man to be fair, not a young child, sail without him, Prince Williams for allowing his sailors to get drunk, or someone else entirely. I'll be back next week with a new video, and until then, keep learning.